Hello and welcome to NASA Science Live. I'm Stephanie Smith from the NASA Headquarters Social Media Team, and we are coming to you live from sunny Central California, Vandenberg Space Force Base to be precise, where hours from now, DART, that's the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, will be lifting off. There's tons of activity going on inside the NASA hangar, so come with me, we're gonna take you inside. You're gonna meet scientists, you're gonna meet engineers, and uh, by the way, we're taking your questions. Just go ahead and use the hashtag AskNASA, or if the feed you're watching has a comment box, pop your questions in there. Moderators are standing by while we take you behind the scenes. Heck, we've even got the shipping container that DART came in from the Applied Physics Lab. And this is the hangar where the launch commentary will be tonight as we get ready to blast off for a date with an asteroid. You might be wondering, does that asteroid pose a threat to us now or after the test? And the short answer is no. It doesn't. In fact, there are no known asteroid threats to Earth for the next hundred years. But it doesn't mean that we're not keeping our eyes on the skies. We'll get into all of that and more on NASA Science Live, but first, let's do a deep dive on DART. In case there was an asteroid coming towards Earth and you're there, you can actually stop it. I mean, that's kind of fantastic. NASA is crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid. What? You think science fiction, but this is real. Never in my life would I have thought I would take a couple hundred million dollar spacecraft and crash it into an asteroid. <laughs> my name is Michelle Chen. I'm Lena Adams. My name is Kelly Fast. I'm Andy Rifkin. I'm Justina Sorovitz, and I help tell the story of the DART mission. I'm a planetary defender. And I study how the orbits of asteroids change after we hit them with spacecraft. My job was primarily to make sure all the systems on the spacecraft work together. The DART mission is NASA's first test of a planetary defense technique called kinetic impactor. DART is the double asteroid redirection test. It's just a spacecraft that is going to go and smack an asteroid. The moon lift Morphos, which orbits the asteroid Didymos. And see if we can change its trajectory just a little bit. In order to show that we can deflect incoming asteroids if we need to. DART will only be changing the period of the orbit of Dimorphos by a, a tiny amount, but in space, just a little bit is just enough to make an asteroid actually miss us. In the event that an asteroid is discovered well ahead of time before it might impact Earth. Behind me, you see the spacecraft. It's really cool to see it coming together in real life. It is fantastic to see it in real life. To see it turn from ideas into real pieces that are gonna go in to space. The solar arrays will actually roll out to 28 feet in length. Once the solar arrays are deployed, it's going to be the size of a school bus. As the solar array opens up, it's going to swing out in this direction. The asteroid is only two football fields in size. We're flying at over six kilometers a second. 30 days out, we see one pixel on our field of view. You can see Didymos and Dimorphos is one point of light. About four hours out, our spacecraft becomes autonomous. And then that's where everything gets really exciting. You actually are seeing impact. We're super excited and nervous as well. I feel really honored and humbled to be working in an area of science that has such a broader impact, you know, figuratively and literally. <laughs> so dark. The dinosaurs are made completely extinct by an asteroid impact so many years ago. Here we are, we can actually do something about it. I think this is just wonderful. Well, now that you've had a chance to see what DART aims to do, we know you've got questions. Let's go ahead and meet the folks who've got answers. Joining me now are Dr. Lori Glaze, the Director of Planetary Science at NASA Headquarters. Lisa Wu, mechanical engineer at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, or APL for short. And then also from APL, Dr. Nancy Chabot, the DART coordination lead. All right, well, thanks so much for being here. How are you feeling on launch day? Amazing, exhilarated. I mean, I just can't even believe this day's here. <laughs> so excited, so excited. Got to go out and look at the rocket this morning, and it's on the pad, and we are so ready to go. It is just so amazing. We are on the pad. We're going to launch tonight. I'm and just... it's beautiful here it is in so California. Nice. Yeah, Vandenberg Air Force Base, Space Force Base, man, old habits die hard, <laughs> can have some really, really thick marine layer and clouds, but the skies are clear, and let's, let's, hope, let's hope for a, a good liftoff, but also clear skies and good visibility. Exactly. Okay, so this show is all about questions. I'm going to start with a few of mine, and then we'll get to yours. Okay, so Lori, 
The big question, why is the DART mission important? Why do we have to do this? Great question. This is a really, really important mission because it is humanity's first ever mission to try and deflect an asteroid to help us prepare for a potential danger in the future. So what we're going to try and do is, is move this asteroid, just change its orbit a little bit, and demonstrate that we can actually do this. This is really, really important that we do this now mm -hmm. when we are, are in a point where we don't know of any asteroids that are potentially dangerous right now, that are, are a significant threat, I should say, those that are a significant threat over the next hundred years. But we want to test this technique so that if and when we discover an asteroid that might be a potential threat, we have this tool in our belt and we're ready to go. Luck favors the prepared, so we want to test the technology before we need it. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Now, Lisa, on, our, on the engineering side of things, you have been with this mission since it was a little baby cad drawing, yes. and now, yes, now it's a full-fledged <laughs> spacecraft sitting on top of its Falcon 9 rocket. Oh, man. Can you tell us more about this amazing machine, how it works, what are its parts, how is it going to sure. do, do, the, do the job it's, it's made to do? Sure, of course. So part of the DART spacecraft, we have this instrument called Draco, and it's basically a camera, the eye of the spacecraft, if you will. Um, on board, we also have this algorithm called SmartNav, built at APL, and together, these two things work as the eye and the brain, and that is how we will go and get to our target. And then on the spacecraft, of course, because our number one mission is to impact this asteroid, that means, you know, we can do a few more technology demonstrations. So we have some really cool technologies like the ROSAs, the rollout solar arrays. Those are really cool because they literally roll out like a yoga mat. And those are our solar arrays. We have our Nexi ion engine and that's going to test out the ion engine. Um, we also have our high gain antenna that uses a radial line slot array. So like these, there's so many cool technologies on this mission and I'm just so excited to have been part of it. You, you're like a, like a <laughs> glowing proud parent over there. Are you Basically. sure, are you sure you're going to be okay when you destroy your spacecraft by slamming it into an asteroid? You know, I worked really hard on spacecraft, but this is for the science. So. <laughs> I'm okay with it smashing okay this with asteroid. It? Okay, for the greater good? Yes, for the um, greater good. But it, one, one follow-up question on that. If you destroy the spacecraft, which is what you intend to do mm -hmm. on a successful day, uh, how will you know? How will you see it? Mm -hmm. So when we're approaching this asteroid, Draco will be sending all these images back to Earth until it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and then... 10 days before we actually impact, we will be deploying a CubeSat, and that CubeSat will be taking pictures of the entire impact. So we will also be getting all of that really cool pictures, so stay tuned. All right. Okay, from engineering over to science. Nancy, this is the first time that we're doing a test of a kinetic impactor. What are you most looking forward to about this test? Well. I'm most looking forward to how much we actually deflect this <laughs> asteroid, right? I mean, this is a test and, you know, these asteroids aren't a threat to the Earth like we were talking about, but we want to do this test before we need to, to be ready. Um, and we're not really sure exactly how much we're going to deflect it. We know it's a double asteroid system oh. because telescopes, there All right. it is. Yeah, we've got, we've got a handy dandy <laughs> how model How handy here is that? Of, yeah, we know it's a Didymos, <laughs> right? Didymos is the main and one. And not, not Didymoon, but Dimorphos. Dimorphos is okay. the smaller one. And it goes around like clockwork every 11 hours and 55 minutes like a so we're just we're coming around sure just like a going clock. around every 11 hours and 55 minutes and telescopes on the earth discovered that this was a double asteroid system and know this and that's why they've gotten this down really precisely and so what's going to happen it's going around okay we're coming around and we're then the around. spacecraft's going to come and slam into it head on oh thank you laurie Woo. that's perfect <laughs> yeah. and there thank we you. go dart spacecraft totally destroyed how are we going to know how much we deflected it? Dart spacecraft is not going to tell us. The Italian Lichia cube CubeSat is, is long gone after some spectacular images. Telescopes on the ground, again, are key to this mission. And we think we're going to change it by maybe about 10 minutes. So the clock will be more like 11 hours and 45 minutes going forward. But we're not really sure. Could be less, could be more. And that's what I'm most excited about learning. And because this is bigger than Dart. 
DART is just the start. We're doing this first test, but we want to understand this to potentially protect the Earth in the future. So I think that also makes this really exciting that it's not just this one test, but how are we going to apply it going forward? Fantastic. Okay, so those are some of my questions. What are your questions? Remember, you can use the hashtag AskNASA if you are on Twitter or Instagram. If you've got a live chat like on YouTube or Facebook, just pop your questions right there and the moderators will get those over to me. And as they do that and we begin to ponder your questions, here's one more uh, for you to ponder. How will DART deflect an asteroid in space? We asked astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Thomas Pesquet to demonstrate in microgravity. Hi everyone, I'm Thomas Pesquet and I'm with my favorite astronaut Shane Kimbrough uh, up here on the space station. Uh, today we're going to talk about a very cool new NASA mission, it's called DART. Can you tell us and tell me a little bit more about what is NASA's DART mission and what does NASA DART mission stand for? Okay, yeah, so DART is NASA's first planetary defense test. Um, so we're going to we're going to try to do something we've never done before uh, with a spacecraft. Uh, DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. So a nice acronym. NASA does like acronyms. Um, DART is another one. Um, and the, now the purpose of this spacecraft and this mission, it has one purpose. And that's to crash itself into an asteroid and try to redirect it or try to move it into a different orbit. So today, Shane, uh, we're going to demonstrate some of those principles uh, that you laid out before, um, but uh, can you tell us exactly how we're going to do that? Well, I can try. We're going to—it's the first time for us, but uh, we're going to try to demonstrate this this asteroid kinetic deflection method, um, which is really the moment that 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 spacecraft crashes into the asteroid. So we're going to use microgravity up here because we have that all the time, and we're going to try to show you. Um, kind of how this is going to work uh, when the asteroid is hit by this spacecraft called DART. Um, so here we go. So what I'll do, Shane's going to be the asteroid, um, and I'm going to be the NASA DART mission. Oh, this CTB, more exactly, is going to be a spacecraft. Um, I'm going to try to throw it, and we'll look at the effect of that mass coming at him and the kinetic energy transfer from the CTB to Shane. Shane will be perfectly stable. <laughs> it's not an easy task. You ready? All right, here it comes. <laughs> I've redirected Shane successfully. <laughs> Pretty good. A while ago, we, we uh, got out the door and we got some new solar arrays here on the space station. And so the same technology we have here now on the space station is going to be used to power the DART mission on its way to this asteroid. IROSA, um, in case you didn't know, but you knew, um, it stands for ISS Rollout Solar Arrays. So we got a chance to go outside and install the very first two of these new IROSAs, or Rollout Solar Arrays, on the very end of the space station out on the port side um, these are different because for one they're much lighter and smaller they're to me they look very fragile when we were picking them up and, and moving them but they're rolled up so they when they launch they're kind of rolled up in, into a compact cylinder uh, which is great for launch conditions um, and, and then once they get up on the space station or in space for a satellite or something they can then roll these things out to be useful and so the same technology we have here now on the space station is going to be used to power the DART mission on its way to crashing into an asteroid. And that's the kind of successful deflection that we're looking for. Okay, we're back with Lori, Lisa, and Nancy to answer your questions. Remember, hashtag AskNASA or just pop them right in the stream wherever you are watching. Okay, first question, and this one has lots of likes. Joseph Forbes on Facebook asks, what of the law of unintended consequences? Is it outside the realm of possibility that a nudge might change an orbit from an innocuous one to one that does put it on a collision course with Earth? 
Yeah, and that's a really, really important question. And it's important to understand that we chose this system here, Didymos and Dimorphos, specifically because it really provides the perfect test case for this um, experiment. Um, where we have no chance of that unintended consequence. And the way I like to think about this is the little moon here, Dimorphos, if you could imagine um, a, a high school football stadium that's full of rocks, that's about the size of that little moon. Um, so you imagine that big football stadium that's full of rocks, and then you take a refrigerator and you ram that refrigerator into that big pile of rocks. So it's going to make a, a little bit of a little tiny change in the speed of that um, little moon, but not very much, just a tiny bit. But over time, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go around Didymos, and it'll, we're hoping to slow it down. Nancy can talk about that a little more, how we slow it down, and it goes around. But overall, this whole system, the, Didymos is like a half a mile across. It's big compared to Dimorphos. Mm -hmm. So when we make this little change to Dimorphos, the overall momentum of this system is pretty much going to be the same. It will not even be detectable what we've done. So okay. it really is exactly why we chose this kind of uh, a binary asteroid system for this kind of experiment. That's one of the reasons why it, it provides such a good example that we, we really, so it is no risk. Physically impossible. Physically impossible. We're not going to set off a billiard ball reaction exactly. in space. Okay, exactly. so everybody rest easy. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Okay, well, maybe not Keith. Keith Taylor asks, I've heard some scientists say that if an Earth killer asteroid was headed our way, you'd need five years to spot it, get to it, bombard it, giving deflected shards enough time to deviate their path and miss us. Is that true? Yeah, warning time is really what you want. And this is really why it's important to understand that planetary defense is much more than just deflecting asteroids. You need to be finding all of the asteroids. This is key to planetary defense, knowing where the asteroids are, characterizing them, tracking them, assessing, collaborating internationally, because it's a global concern. We're all on this planet together. And then mitigating, doing something about it if you need it to. And that's where DART comes in, into this one larger strategy. And so really, you want to give yourself this warning time, because something like this is just a small nudge, which adds up to a big position change over time. So the asteroid in the Earth theoretically wouldn't be on a path to hit in the future on a collision course. And this is why you need this warning time and you have to do so much more to find the asteroids. And there's actually a lot that we need to do on that still. I guess maybe you wanna pick it up there, Lori. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I wanna add just a little bit to that because what Nancy said is so correct that it's critically important that we uh, identify the asteroids and then characterize them so we know their orbits. And so right now we have ground-based telescopes that are observing the night sky every night, looking and searching for these asteroids. We actually also have um, a space-based telescope um, called NEO-WISE, which was a repurposed uh, astrophysics mission that was originally called WISE, and it's out there also looking for asteroids. But we, uh, we're still, we know there's still many of these smaller asteroids out there that we haven't discovered yet. So we actually have a new mission that we've just started called NEO Surveyor, the Near Earth Object Surveyor mission. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just getting underway now. And that's going to be a really powerful mission uh, when it gets launched a few years from now, uh, that its sole purpose is to really uh, every, every day and every night to be searching the skies, looking for um, these, uh, these asteroids, essentially the same size as Dimorphos, helping us better understand what the potential threats are that are out there. Always keeping those eyes on the <laughs> skies, right? Okay, so back to little Dimorphos here for a second. Um, what's going to happen to the debris from the asteroid? Well, the debris is actually, we think, going to be an important part of the experiment. So we think DART's going to come, well, DART will come speeding in at 15,000 miles per hour, and it's going to crash into Dimorphos, right? But we think that Ejecta is going to go off in the other direction and actually give it even an extra push, like a little jet engine that shoots out from it, right? The rocks shoot out from it in the other way. And uh, But how much of that happens is one of the reasons that we want to do this test on a real asteroid, too, because real asteroids have different shapes and different sizes and boulders and how are they put together and what is the strength. Um, so then these uh, this debris, though, is, is very, very small. It'll stay with the system and, again, no threat to the Earth whatsoever. All right, so let's go over back to uh, engineering. Um, Yadi on Twitter wants to know, how do you know if it worked? 
Well, you see, we have this camera, um, Draco, as I mentioned before, and that's going to be sending pictures back to Earth. And about four hours out, that is when SmartNav, the brain of Dart, actually will start taking over. So we'll not be joysticking the spacecraft from Earth. It's fully autonomous, four hours out. And then at one hour is when we actually will start seeing the smaller asteroid. And SmartNav will start firing off thrusters, getting it closer and closer to its target until, you know, we will hit it. <laughs> okay. So question for the entire panel here. Logan on YouTube wants to know, how long have you been working on DART? Oh, I'm going to let, I think Lisa should start on this <laughs> well, one. Okay, because I think we've, we've got, we've got, you know, you're coming at this from a lot of different angles. Correct. From, from sort of the NASA science and business side. Right. Engineering, building, and then the science, the science that really starts with, uh, you know, with that impact. Yeah, so, so I've been on DART for yeah. five years about when I started and joined the DART team. So NASA started initial development phase of DART in 2015, and I started shortly after that on the project as well. And it's just been a joy to join this team. One of the things that I love about being on a team like this is it takes so much different expertise mm. to all come together in order to accomplish something that's so much bigger than any one person could do on their own. And, and DART, obviously, is a key example of that and you know I've just overjoyed to be a part of this mission. Yeah. So I've been on DART for three years. This is my very first spacecraft so I'm super excited for launch and the fact that I was a part of building the spacecraft. Like how many people get to say that? I built the spacecraft like wow. Um, I'm just a few years out of college so like to everyone out there this is so cool. <laughs> no, you, you got your foot in the door at APL. Yes. And you did a rotation there? Yeah. That, that landed you yes. on DART? So right out of undergrad, I went to APL, and I was in a rotation program where I went to all different types of groups at the lab. Um, one of them, one of my projects was DART. And, you know, I, I really liked it. So here I am three years later. That is so cool. That's and so cool. Did you did you green light this thing? Or do we so, have you to thank for this mission, Lori? <laughs> well, I've been paying for this mission, yes. Out of, <laughs> thank out of you. Well, well, we thank you very much. <laughs> um, but so I, I joined NASA headquarters about three and a half years ago. And uh, prior to that, I was uh, a scientist and, and doing my, my research at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And of course, I knew about DART, but I was not specifically involved with DART. But when I came to headquarters in my current role, DART is a part of my overall portfolio for planetary science. And when I look across our entire portfolio, um, I was so excited to, to actually have DART be a part of this when I came in because we have a lot of great science missions, but we only have one planetary defense mission, or we did at the time, now we have two. But at that time, there was only one and DART. And I thought, you know, we have an amazing opportunity with this mission to, uh, to tell the world about how important it is that we defend our planet and, and get more planetary defenders um, out there. And so it's been a really, really important part of what we do in planetary science. Okay, so, all right. From the personal stories back to the science, Nancy, uh, Jake Smith, 9287, wants to know, could asteroids be the reason water came to Earth? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, asteroids are fascinating objects. They're the relics of the early solar system. They were the building blocks of the planets. Um, and so they really did bring a lot of important stuff to the planets. Water might have been one of them, along with other materials. That's really an active area of science um, that's that's fascinating. And we have some other missions that NASA is doing that are really in a position to address that, specifically like the OSIRIS-REx mission. So maybe, Lori, you want to say a few words there? I'll say a few words. We're here to talk about about DART today, yeah. <laughs> but I will give a, a quick shout out to the OSIRIS-REx mission, which collected a sample um, a year ago in October and is now on its way back to Earth to bring that back. And that's a particularly special asteroid because we do think not only did it have water bearing uh, minerals on it, but also organic molecules. So not just delivering water to Earth and other planets, but also the building blocks for life. And as Nancy says, these are, are fantastic um, relics of the early solar system that each tell us different parts of the story of how our solar system formed and evolved. I think that's what's neat about asteroids, too, is that you kind of can look in the past, right? You know, these things that are before the Earth, right, that we can look back to see how they did. But we're really talking here about the present 
right? You know, with yeah. what the current threat to the earth might be from these, and then preparing for the future where we can be ready to do something about this if we needed to. So it sort of spans this whole thing with asteroids. Yeah, well, Osiris Rex is on the minds of others too. Astro Balrog on Twitter wants to know, does the DART mission have a volunteer ambassador team like Osiris Rex did? And if so, he wants in, or <laughs> she, or they. But Astro Balrog wants in. Okay. <laughs> Planetary defenders? Would that Planetary be Planetary defenders. I think that's the, the best way to go there. Um, and you maybe have the URL there for the, for I the do, planetary actually. defenders. Stay tuned. You have to you have to wait <laughs> a little later in the show, but we'll tell you but how to yes, be a planetary, be a planetary, planetary defender. defender. And I will say on the DART website, we recently posted some great outreach materials. So you can go under outreach on the DART website and there's a, a kit where you can build the DART spacecraft out of blocks. So cool. Yeah, I saw that the other night. It's awesome. Um, there's a virtual spacecraft that you can kind of go like Pokemon Go and like put it out there and take your, you know, see it in your scene and, and some other fun things. So uh, definitely there's a lot of stuff ramping up and check that out. Okay, so back to our system. Seth on YouTube asks, how close are Didymos and Dimorphos to each other? If you were standing on one, would you be able to see the other? Yeah, that models to scale. Okay. And so this is, uh, this is the right scale for how it should be. So it, I don't know if people are familiar with um, the Washington, D.C. area, but this is the analog that I have in my mind. Okay. Um, the whole system, Didymos and Dimorphos, would fit between the U.S. Capitol building and the Washington Monument. So you can absolutely see the Washington Monument from the Capitol building. Right. And you would see Dimorphos from Didymos. There we go. Okay. So, um, Nancy. Lily Hall on Twitter wants to know, how long ago did you identify the target asteroid? Well, there was the uh, 1990s that this was discovered to be a binary asteroid system. A double asteroid system was the first time that that was seen. I mean, so, uh, but, you know, DART mission didn't exist then. So, you know, it was sort of uh, talked about in some science conferences and planetary defense conferences, this whole idea of a double asteroid system. Actually, one of my colleagues, Andy Chang at APL, was one of the ones who originated it. He likes to tell this story where he was uh, exercising in his basement and it just sort of came to him. And uh, anyways, then he sort of shared it with colleagues who have been thinking about planetary defense. And Didymos is just the ideal target because of this double asteroid nature. Nancy, do you want to talk for just a minute about how we know it's a, a binary asteroid and how we know what the orbit is of Dimorphos around Didymos? Yeah, what's really interesting, right? I mean, and even if you look at the model, like those two are pretty close to each other. And from Earth, it just looks like a single point of light. You can't mm. see that there's two asteroids especially, there. Especially, especially if it's back but, Okay, here. so yeah, yeah, so when it's behind like that, right, what you only see the big one, so yeah. it's less bright. But yeah. when it comes out to the side, there, it's brighter because you're getting the light from both of those objects in the same frame, and then it's darker, and then it goes around. And so the, you just uh, map out the brightness versus time, brightness versus time, take lots of measurements, and over this 11 hours and 55 minutes, this brightness versus time changes. And that's a, really a great way, and that's the same technique that's going to be used to, to figure out how much we deflected the asteroid. So it's a great cool. story. Okay, we're getting lots and lots of questions about asteroids, what we know, what we don't. So we asked a NASA scientist, does NASA know about all the asteroids? Does NASA know about all the asteroids? Well, no, <laughs> but the good news is we know where most of the really big ones are. They get closest to the Earth. We found more than 90% of these. That's the great news, but there are a lot more smaller pieces that are still out there that we haven't found. It's really challenging to find asteroids and comets simply because even though some of them are as big as mountains, space is incredibly huge and these things can be really far away. In fact, we want to find them when they're very far away from the Earth, so we have lots of time to take action if we ever find one that's really headed in our direction. Asteroids are both a source of fascination, but sometimes fear, because we wonder, can they hit the Earth? It's really incredibly unlikely that a significant asteroid impact is going to occur in our lifetimes. However, that said, if even one happens, it could be really bad. And that's why we want to go out and look for these objects and make sure that the Earth and an asteroid never get too close for comfort. So does NASA know about all the asteroids? Well, no, but we know what we have to do and we're on the job and we're really glad to be part of Team Planetary Defense.
So as you can see, NASA has an entire team of planetary defenders working to keep our planet safe. And we want you. That's right. You can become a planetary defender today by visiting bit.ly.com slash planetary defender and test your knowledge. If you do well enough on the quiz, you will be able to get a special badge that you can share on social media, hashtag planetary defender, so that we can see it over on the social media team here at NASA. And with that, we're going to go back to questions. Okay, next one up is from Matthew Cummins. How do you determine what weight the spacecraft should be and its speed in relation to the weight and speed of the asteroid in order to change the asteroid's trajectory? All right, physics question coming at you, oh, yeah. engineer. Oh, yeah. Momentum. <laughs> physics. <laughs> um, so, as we all know, the asteroid is quite large and DART is quite small. We're about the size of a smart car and we weigh roughly like 1360 pounds. So, you know, compared to how big the asteroid is, which, as you said, it's like a football stadium filled with rocks, we're like really, really small. But we are going super, super fast. We're going 15,000 miles per hour, which for scale is like four miles per second. So try going that fast. That's a really fast. Um, and with that and, you know, momentum, you hit something, transfer momentum. That's how we're doing it. The good old F equals MA. <laughs> yes. All right. My, my favorite, my favorite equation. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, you, do you have favorite equations or is that just me? <laughs> Okay, just just me. I guess it's just you. Okay. <laughs> we Don't leave equations. me hanging, Internet. If you have a favorite equation, please post it in the chat, and, then, and I will go back and I will like it later. Okay. Um, <laughs> Cal Lachini, uh, Craig McGuire, how long is it going to take DART to get to this asteroid? Nancy, how long do you have to wait to start your science? Well, once we launch tonight, and then it'll be 10 months. So uh, late September of 2022 is going to be the smashing event, if you will. And uh, so, yeah, uh -huh, it's, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. thank you very much. Right I know there. it's yeah. there's a lot of bad puns out there, so I just embrace <laughs> them. Um, but yeah, then we'll use uh, the telescopes on the Earth. Um, we'll actually continue observing until around March of 2023, even, because we're timing this in 2022, such that the distance between Didymos and Earth is still large, totally safe, but is minimized. And so the telescopes on Earth are going to get the most precise data that they possibly can. They'll be able to observe for months in order to really get a measure of how much we deflected this asteroid. So, And at this point in the day, it's still fall 2022, late September, early October. But how soon are you going to know when you have your date with destiny? At a... Uh, 1022. <laughs> <laughs> when we launch at 1021, as soon as we launch, um, that that'll set the uh, date for Dart's collision with Dimorphos. So awesome! And then we can we can send out a save the date so that you can all join us back. Um, yeah. What do you say? Do you want to do you want to do do another? We'll do another live show, yeah, right? I'm on live yeah, show. for sure. Yeah, We're in. you'll be there, Lori. <laughs> oh, right? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, Slice Fire on YouTube, what are your future plans? I'm going to put the, give this one to you, Lori. What are your future plans for the use of this new technology that Dart's going to give us? Great, great question. So the first step, of course, as Nancy has said, is that we need to assess the data. We really need to learn from this experiment. We need to learn and understand, number one, how well the smart nav system works, mm -hmm. how well we're able to target the asteroid um, and, and, and impact it. Um, and then we need to understand how well that momentum transfer actually happens. Um, you know, we don't know necessarily if the rock is solid rock or whether it's just a collection of rubble. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to make a difference on how effective we can transfer the, the momentum. So we need to really assess that data and understand how well did this technique work. We also have some other techniques that we've been studying and thinking about for asteroid deflection um, that we may want to think about um, perhaps for a future test or uh, for comparison okay, with how so the kinetic impact. Other than kinetic impact. Yeah, so there's a couple other ideas that are out there that have also been explored and have been investigated. One is something called a gravity tractor. Mm -hmm. 
um, which to me sounds like uh, science fiction, but it is actually for real, <laughs> right? That you can, by um, adjusting the mass of an object, by maybe taking off some mass or putting some mass onto it, you can change um, its gravity field. Um, and so it's possible to actually change that a little bit. Another thought that's been out there is to uh, potentially take a nuclear device and detonate it, not detonate the asteroid. I'll make that clear. You want to detonate it near the asteroid to, to give it a bit of a push, a bit of a big force. Um, and just for the record, we don't want to blow up an asteroid. Nor do we want to hire a ragtag group of no. drillers to go out there and place it. I think on. I saw that one. What? <laughs> yeah, I just want to explain though why you don't want to, ex you know, explode an asteroid because a lot of people say well I've seen it in the movies don't you want to just explode the asteroid and the problem with that idea is that if the asteroid is on a collision course with earth and you blow it up you then not just have one rock coming towards Earth, you now have thousands of rocks Boom. coming towards now Earth. Now we have new problems. And then we have new problems. <laughs> okay. So we really don't want to blow it up. Okay. Um, so, so those are things that we're thinking about for the future. I already mentioned the NEO Surveyor mission, which is another thing right. we have in our, in our pocket for the future. A really important part, as I said, to make sure we find all of the asteroids and then we know which ones are potential threat. Okay. Um, right now we know all of the asteroids, we think we know almost all the ones that are mm -hmm. really big, mm -hmm. um, the ones that could like wipe out the dinosaurs, that right. kind of size, but the smaller ones like Dimorphos and larger, we still know there's a lot out there we haven't discovered. And, and obviously yeah. we're, we're really, really excited about the HERA mission too. Oh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. so the European you. Space yeah. Agency in, uh, is gonna rendezvous with the Didymos Dimorphos system with the HERA mission in 2026 which is gonna be great. They'll be able to see the crater made by DART. They'll be able to get the mass of Dimorphos and really characterize the system every more. So along with all of everything that Lori said, to, we have to figure out from DART. And we're just really working collaboratively with these two teams as is important for planetary defense, international issue. Absolutely. Okay, um, so obviously uh, Earth, we're all very, very invested in, uh, in watching out for asteroids on the collision course with Earth. Origami Masters on Twitter wants to know, how often are there asteroid impacts um, with other planets in our solar system? Oh, oh I, regularly, all the time. In yeah. fact, we've even seen some of them from Earth. Uh, we've actually saw an asteroid, for example, that went into Jupiter's atmosphere several years back. That was kind of cool. Um, on Mars, where we've been having um, spacecraft that orbit at Mars um, for decades now, um, we can see new craters all the time that are being created by um, asteroids that um, impact on Mars. So we know this is a process that's happening all over the solar system. At Earth, objects are entering Earth's atmosphere all the time, very small ones. We actually get reasonable sized meteorites that, that fall all the way to the surface and don't burn up for, on a regular basis. So they're, they're pretty common out there, but hopefully you know, the ones that are the bigger ones are, are not quite as common. Okay, so we uh, we have teacher and and her students all the way from Hawaii. Hawaiian Disney Mama on YouTube asks, Aloha, my students want to know if the asteroid didn't hit Earth back in the day and wipe out all the dinosaurs, would dinosaurs still be alive today? Oh. We're gonna test the breadth of your Ooh. science. <laughs> that is speculation. That here. is a really <laughs> hypothetical question because there's so many uh, variables at play there. Okay. Um, so many different things that have happened um, since that time. It was uh, quite a long time ago, of course. Fair, um, fair. But you know, the one thing we like to say is that, you know, the dinosaurs didn't have uh, the Planetary Defense Coordination Office. They didn't have a planetary defender to help them save the day. So right. they didn't that's have what we're here to build a spacecraft to go out there <laughs> and, right. and save them all. Okay. But thank you, and we hope that you'll be watching. Yes. Okay. Um, on to Shannon Wayne Bowman on Facebook. Ooh, will we get to see it crash live? And would we be able to see it with the naked eye by looking up? So the images are gonna come streaming back from Draco once every second, and we will be sure to get those images back before the dart collision <laughs> happens. So they'll be sent and on their way, streaming back every one per second, and that's gonna be uh, information that we'll have here on the Earth. The Lichia Cube images will get transmitted back um, a few weeks later, and it'll take them a little bit longer, so they'll capture them and store them on board and then send them back after the fact. Um, you're not really gonna be able to look up and see anything with the naked eye. Again, this is like a tiny little nudge. We're changing it 
it, so you're not even be able to see it on that scale model over there. So it's uh, it's not going to be the sort of thing that you can look yeah. up and see, but the images coming back will be spectacular. And correct me if I'm wrong, Nancy, but I believe what the time of the impact, um, and Lisa, that the, the uh, Didymos and Dimorphos will be about six and a half million miles away from Earth. So it's yep. a long way away. Very far. It's yeah. long, but it's not as long as a lot of things. It's actually pretty close in the things, but, but very safe. And with your eye. You won't be able to see it. You need some powerful <laughs> telescopes to even be able to see how the brightness changes with time. Okay, okay, so this is not something that the home astronomer is going to be able to, to point their, their telescope at and find in the night sky. No, okay. no, that's not the plan. Okay. We've got plenty of other stuff. We'll tell you, just stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> um, now, for those of you who are just joining us, again, Get your questions in, use the hashtag AskNASA. You can also pop stuff right in the stream, in the chat, wherever you are watching. And because some folks are just tuning in, um, we are getting a lot of some of the questions that you've handled. Uh, one that I think we have got like a, a public responsibility to touch on again is um, <laughs> Donna. Donna, we hear you. Donna K. Bradshaw on Facebook wants to know what if this puts the asteroid in a chaotic rotation that causes a horrible chain reaction and it becomes a threat to Earth. Lori? Sure. Yeah, and again, I'm happy to answer this question as many times as you ask it because it's really an important question. And we really, we chose this particular um, double asteroid system, this binary asteroid system, precisely because it does not pose a threat. There is zero risk of, of that kind of unintended consequence. Um, the, uh, the impact that we are, are going to have on the small moon, on Dimorphos, here, um, is, it on over to is very, very tiny, thank you. Yes, we'll impact here, but that little impact is really not gonna change at all. It has no chance of changing the overall system of how fast the overall system's going or its path. So nothing will change in the whole Didymos system. It's going to stay exactly on the same trajectory where it is now, which is of no threat to Earth. It's not coming anywhere near Earth um, anytime in uh, you know at least 100 years and probably longer than that. So okay, so rest easy yeah. and enjoy the show too, right? Yeah. This is this is exciting. Um, Chris Betancourt on Facebook wants to know what kind of systems do we have in place. To, to monitor potentially dangerous asteroids. We've talked about the ones that we know. How are we keeping our eyes on the skies? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, we have uh, many ground-based telescopes that are searching the night skies every single night looking for potentially hazardous asteroids and comets. Um, and we also have uh, a space-based telescope, um, which I think I mentioned earlier, called NEO-WISE. Uh, which is uh, an old astrophysics telescope that we we took over uh, for planetary defense purposes. Um, it also is out looking uh, for uh, looking for asteroids, but also characterizing them. Um, and then we have this new mission, the NEO Surveyor, Near Earth Object Surveyor mission, which we hope to launch um, perhaps in the next five years or so. Um, that will be dedicated to searching for those new asteroids. And, and you do work in conjunction with the amateur astronomy community, right? Good point, yes. We work with the amateur astronomy community, and it's a global network, right? This is, planetary defense is not something that's unique to the yeah. United States mm -hmm. um, or any particular country. This is a global issue, and there are many space agencies and others around the world that all work together uh, to coordinate the observations, someone detects an asteroid and they send a signal out to everybody that says, hey, I found this asteroid, and everybody points their telescope and says, let me follow up so we can better constrain just where that um, asteroid, what its orbit is, and, and where it is, and what uh, what it looks like, and characterize it, its size. Um, so it's it is really a, an international collaboration. And as a, a follow-up to that, uh, Mark New on Facebook wants to know, what are the benefits of global creativity and global cooperation in such an important mission? Well, I think the, the global cooperation is absolutely critical. Um, if, if there ever were actually a, a real threat, we are all going to have to come together as a global community mm -hmm. um, to, to help put all our resources together, um, whether it is to uh, make sure we better define the threat, to put together whatever the mitigation plans are, to help protect ourselves from a potential threat. Um, so it is. Ab this is an absolutely critical um, international cooperation. 
And Lennon on YouTube um, wants to know, is there any other country openly working on planetary defense or is it just NASA? No, right there. I, I think Nancy just mentioned oh, a couple minutes Hera. ago the Hera. Hera mission that's being built by the European Space Agency. I mean, it, we've got Lichia Cube, right? Yes, so Lichia Italian Cube. Space Agency it's already, already actively contributed We're with their. And then, yeah, Hera um, from the European Space Agency. And so it, yeah. it really is uh, people around the world and agencies around the world working together cooperatively for this. I mean, the database that you're referring to is all publicly available, right? I mean, you put it all into the same database. It's constantly monitored, updated, real time, and you know you can go check it out at the NASA website. Yeah. So to get a sense of scope, how many people have been involved in this mission? Maybe we can kind of tote it up from from the different parts of NASA, even just represented by the three of you. <laughs> I'll pass it over to you guys. Let's see. Yeah. What's the well, size of your uh, your team there? Uh, my engineering team. So mechanical engineering, we have about, I want to say like a handful, 10. Mm -hmm. But like there's so many people. We have our INT folks, our electrical folks. We have people who make our blankets, former seamstresses. We have our truck drivers who have to drive this spacecraft across the country. Like there's a lot of people. And I also want to note that like, where I've been working with like roughly 50% women and that is so rare in an engineering field. So I'm so thankful to be working on a project where I have so many role models. It's super cool. <laughs> Great. And yeah, how about definitely the, how about the, the team, team. If you have to do it, you should guess in the thousands, right? Yeah. I mean, hundreds is too low. Once you get to that the other day, I mean, you know, I mean, like the creating the Dart logo, right? What you were talking about, so cool. I mean, it's just uh, it goes takes people. We have a, I mean, we have an APL, right? And then there's NASA. We have scientists across the country. We have scientists actually around the world on this team. Um, and you know, we have a lot of different partners. And really, uh, thousands is going to be the right yeah. order of magnitude yep. to to get there. Okay. Okay. So uh, earlier, Lisa, you talked a little bit about some of the technologies that are on DART. Um, just, you know, tw between us and the internet, uh, Natosha on YouTube wants to know, does DART carry any explosive devices? <laughs> no. I did not put any explosive devices on the spacecraft. And Lisa would know. <laughs> I you would were know. one of the last people to see the spacecraft, Yes, I right? was one of the last people to see the spacecraft before we encapsulated. I know this thing inside out, so no explosives. Fantastic. Okay, on to Facebook. Marcel on Facebook asks, why crash the spacecraft and not try a soft landing and then use the engine of the spacecraft to push the asteroid? Goes back to momentum transfer, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to? You know, we are hitting this asteroid really, really fast. The amount of thrust we'll need if we, per se, like landed on the asteroid and tried to like push ourselves, it's way, way like a lot. It's much easier just to use the momentum or art. We already have 15,000 miles per hour to hit the asteroid. Yeah, but I think Lori's point is good too, right? Yeah. I mean, that this is just one technology, exactly. right? It's the most mature, it's the one that's ready to test now. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the future we'll want to have other tools in yeah. our toolkit. And people have talked about using idea. engines, yeah. specifically the ion engines, but right. you'd have to have it burn for a really long time, oh, yeah. right? I mean, as compared to like this instantaneous <laughs> event, it would be, you would have to operate the spacecraft. And that's challenging in its own right, mm -hmm. right? You know, to have that sort of fidelity. And asteroids are, not round. <laughs> you know, they have all sorts of complications with them, and landing is its own complication. So, but DART really is just the start. It's just the first test of one technique that you might use, and it'll be interesting to see what else we might develop in the future. And you, you got to walk before you run, right? It is exactly. a technical challenge in and of itself just to make contact with this. Okay. So, uh, Lori, and that is another sort of tween us questions. Uh -oh. Boo. <laughs> on Facebook who's watching from Canada's East Coast, wants to know if an asteroid was headed straight for Earth, would you inform the public? Absolutely. Also, I don't even have to think about that one. We have, um, we're, before you get to the rest of the question, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we actually have um, not just a, uh, a group that is collaborating and cooperating amongst uh, multiple federal agencies in the United States, but working with other agencies around the world. We meet regularly. There are conferences every year to bring all of these various entities together and talk about what are we going to do and how are we going to communicate this if we ever had a potential threat. So absolutely, 
the, the public would be told. We would um, provide the best information that we have available, and we would start developing uh, what the mitigation plans are and um, also any kind of protection plans that we need for people. So there's, there's no doubt. And also, we couldn't hide it. <laughs> no. No, you can't like any, it. you look up, those <laughs> amateur astronomers that we depend on so much to help give us more observations, yeah. everyone would see it. As, as Nancy said, when we look at these data and we calculate the trajectories and their orbits, this isn't a public database. Anybody has access to that. So there's... As soon as an asteroid's discovered, you can know about it too, right? That's I mean, right. It's, it's out there. Yeah. So maybe you took the Planetary Defender quiz, it whet your appetite, and then you want to join us? We'd be happy to have you. You bet. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Nancy, um, our, you know, talking about our, our little asteroid here, our little st football stadium full of rocks, <laughs> uh, James Taylor on YouTube wants to know, do you know the composition of these two asteroids, especially the one targeted for impact? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we do know from uh, ground-based observations, again, is the larger one, Didymos, is a S-type asteroid. It's an ordinary chondrite-type meteorite material. This is actually the most common type of material that falls to the Earth. We haven't actually directly measured Dimorphos, but the way that we think that binary asteroids form, these double asteroids form, it's going to have a similar composition to the main one. So uh, good likelihood that it's going to be made of this ordinary chondrite material, which ordinary chondrites are mixtures of rock and metal mixed together. They're 4.5 billion years old. They predate the planets. They're fascinating just from the science that you get from them as well. But it also makes it really relevant because it's the most common type of thing to hit the Earth. So that makes this a great test and a very appropriate a test for this for dart okay so jay has a very practical question um, on facebook for someone who's interested in entering uh, a field like the three of yours science or engineering what basic courses do you suggest um, you know to set you up for a, a career involved with a nasa mission that's a great question i'll give some of mine and then we can all <laughs> jump in here um, for me, I got started doing uh, math and physics, um, and I think that's probably fundamental yep. for a lot of things, but uh, I would definitely uh, encourage math and physics, All for right. sure. Yeah, so. same. Else? I love math and physics. That's something I really enjoyed in high school, so I decided to keep going with it. Engineering sounded cool. You're solving problems, building things, so that's what I went with. Yeah, I have a PhD in planetary science. I was just fascinated by planets. Uh, I blame Star Wars, which I love from an early, early age. But I guess also one thing I want to stress is that you should do what you're passionate about and that it really does take all types to do this NASA missions. I mean, if you could look around where I am right now, you would see people with lots of different skills. And I mean, communicating is an important part hey, of this as well. Yeah, right? if somebody had told me when I was 17 years old that science communication was a job, I would not have taken the sort of circuitous path Path that I did. I'm glad that I did, though, because uh, lots of different skills go into this. And when I was in school, social media wasn't even a field. Right. Well, Nancy makes a great point. It's something when I give public talks, mm -hmm. especially to kids, try to always emphasize that, you know, people say, I, I want to work for NASA, but I, I'm not good at math or science, or I don't want to be a scientist or an engineer. So, well, we have lawyers, mm -hmm. we have financial people that do our budgets, we have communications people, we have artists, we have yeah. animators, um, we have policy people that help us deal and work with Congress. Mm -hmm. You know, we have so many different skills that are really required and we can't do a mission like DART or any of our missions without all of those skill sets. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, and if you think about planetary defense, like everything we were talking about, right? I mean, this has a lot of implications beyond just, you know, the science and the engineering to make it come together and then what that is going forward. And, um, and I think that's one of the things I really love about working at APL and on missions and with NASA missions and this sort of thing, just so many different people mm -hmm. coming together together with a common goal. Yeah. Okay, well you are all smiles and I've got, <laughs> got the warm fuzzies about collaboration and the village coming together. Um, this is going to be our final question. Kivo Bellone on YouTube wants to know, what's been everyone's favorite moment or part of the work that you have done on this mission? I think my favorite moment's going to happen tonight <laughs> so far. I mean, agreed. <laughs> So I'm going to go with that. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm just so looking forward to the launch tonight. Yeah. So one of my favorite moments was, I mean, I 
was with this spacecraft from its youth until its adulthood. Um, and part of integration and testing was testing it. So after this was a bare structure, we put it all together and then we put it on a vibration table and seeing that spacecraft shaking on a vibration table, it was crazy. I thought we were gonna break it, but of course, analysis, we did not break it and it survived, which means it will survive launch loads. So like that was really cool to like go through the whole testing process and just see the spacecraft grow up. That's so cool. There's been a lot of amazing moments so far, but I am going to say that my favorite moment is still to come for <laughs> sure. So I'm looking forward to Dart getting off the planet and going over to Demorphos. All right, well, I know that you are all very busy and everyone here, myself included, is all a Twitter uh, about this launch tonight. So thank you so much, Lori, Lisa, Nancy, Will, and, and to all of you, Thank you for joining us. This show, NASA Science Live, is nothing without you. You are part of the conversation, and we're so, so happy to have you. So thank you, and know that you can learn more about DART by visiting nasa.gov slash DART mission, and join the conversation on Twitter and Instagram by using hashtag DART mission. Launch is literally hours away, and we do not want you to miss it. So you can set your reminders, set your alarms, and know we're streaming live on nasa.gov slash live, NASA television, the NASA app, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Daily Motion, Twitter, wherever you get your socials, we're gonna be there. And we wanna hear from you. DART is set to lift off at, from Vandenberg Space Force Base at exactly 1021 p.m. Pacific time, because if we, it's an instantaneous launch window, so, we, if we launch tonight at that second, or we try again tomorrow or the next day. Um, we hope that you'll be watching wherever you are. Thanks for making some space for us, and we will see you online.